All right. All right, folks. Uh, welcome to another session of the Hinkley Club's bi uh, bi bi monthly uh, Zoom sessions. Tonight, we're going to go over uh, Hinkley maintenance. Uh, we have. Uh, I'm your host, Barry Hinkley. We have my uncle Hank Hinkley, who is the uh, the youngest of the second generation of boat builders, uh, and wrote the book Hinkley Yacht Care and Maintenance: uh, How to Maintain a Hinkley by Hinkley. Uh, and then we have Alan Sprague, who I worked with at Bass Harbor Marine back uh, in the during the Carter and Reagan administrations, uh, so <laughs> quite a long time ago. And uh, Alan kept going long after they ran me ran me off. And as many of you know, Bass Harbor Marine was a division of uh, Hinkley for quite a while. Then we have John Pratt, who worked for my grandfather, my father, a few other people, and is now working for the present ownership of Hinkley and. I think between the three of these folks, they, as I said in the email that I sent out, they have forgotten more about boats individually, <laughs> not collectively, than any of us will ever know. I've talked through a lot of the rebuilds um, to all three of you with great interest. In fact, I discovered a rebuild by accident that, that Pratt had done, and that was when I was selling a, a Hinkley uh, picnic boat EP, which is the extended pilot house version of the original classic that – we found out during survey had hit a ledge at night going about 25 knots and tore the bottom out of it. And uh, John put that back together uh, painstakingly to the point where you, you couldn't even notice it. And uh, it took almost x-ray vision to, uh, to detect it during survey. So uh, why don't we um, just go around the horn, Hank, and one, since you're, uh, you're at the top of the clock here, we'll go uh, Hank, Alan, and John, and sort of just give, give, your, give a little overview of what you've done. And then um, and, and if you could talk about your favorite project that you've done uh, recently. And then I, this is mostly going to be Q&A. So just a couple minutes on who you guys are, what you're working on or have worked on. And then we're going to go to the audience. So when we go to the audience, if you guys could raise your hands, use the, the hand raising um, button so we don't talk over each other. And we can and we can hopefully get some questions answered here tonight. Because I know a lot of guys you have questions. You know what a hand raising button yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Um, right. All right. Yes, so, okay. yeah, why don't you kick it off, Uncle Hank? Yeah. Um, I'm Hank Hinkley. I'm Bob Hinkley's youngest brother. And... Um, Worked at the Inkley Company off and on for many years, and then ended up uh, starting a company called Ocean Cruising Yachts. One thing that's important, I think I saw the names of a couple of OC owners here. Uh, John Pratt, here on the bottom screen, was the head of the systems department there for a while. And uh, so you've got the man to know more about the electrical and mechanical. Uh, and probably he has some operating brain cells since he's still <laughs> working in the middle of all this. Uh, uh, but I, so I'm, I'm anxious for you to meet John. Uh, he's a great resource. And Alan, of course, has uh, been in every facet of this thing. But uh, I've been at it since I think I started Hinkley Company helping my father with glass at age eight. I started working summers at 11 and I've been in it for the most part since then at various places. But uh, uh, I think the most fun I've had with a, a rebuild recently has been at Bermuda 40. And uh, my friend Wayne Klein was on here and I attempted to do it. And then I ended up taking over a boat yard and we had to pass it off and uh, later on picked it up and finished it off. But uh, it was kind of fun. It was a right down to the bare wood bulkheads, all the wiring, all of everything got replaced on the boat, except the mast, the hull and the deck molding. I think it's just about it. A big project was not inexpensive, but it's about as close to a new boat as you can get. And that, that was a lot of fun. Had its moments, but a lot of fun to do that. But What hull number was that, Hank? Oh, God. Wink, do you remember? It was maybe not there anymore. Uh, uh, Hank, no, I, I don't, Hank. Uh, yeah. it was, was the name Acadia? Uh, uh, that, did uh, that help? You? Yeah, actually, uh, Jim, you remember. Right. That's the boat, Jim, that you and I had at one point. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Yeah, it was it was uh, like boat number. Uh, was it? It was in the area one forty eight, one fifty two, I think, somewhere in that area. But then it any. Yeah, one forty eight uh, sounds right to me. Hank. Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, I think, finished in the uh, middle seventies, something like that. But Alan, go ahead, take it. Okay. Um, I guess 
my history is uh, starting at the Hinkley Company. I had to think about this for a while. Uh, I think it was 1974 when I first started there. Um, John was, I believe you were in the elect electrician's hey, Jan, department. Yeah. Do you remember the original name of the Hinkley? You might want to put yourself on mute, sir. Oh, on the wheel was the original name was still on there. <laughs> if you guys aren't speaking, put yourselves on mute. That'd be great. Thank you. Go ahead, Alan. Okay. Um, it was, of course, um, it, for anybody who wanted to do service work at the Hinkley Company, you had to be go through the production side of things first to learn how things were made and uh, the proper way that uh, things should look in uh, when they're all finished. But then uh, I had a, a daughter, <clears throat> birth of a daughter at the time, and Hinkley Company then was required to be 45 hours a week. And I um, had an offer of a better pay and shorter hours. So I, I did house carpentry for a while after the Hankley company, uh, not really liking it because it something about working on boats where it's uh, more of a cerebral op operation sometimes than just uh, fitting blocks together. Uh, so Frank Kibbe, I don't know how many of you who remember him, um, called me back to the Hinkley company, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and uh, started working over at what was just starting out to be Bass Harbor Marine up until then. I, I, I'm sorry, Bob is not here because he was a big instigator of the Bass Harbor Marine when it was just um, Rusty Bradford and Matt Clow who worked there so kind of after hours doing um boat um, uh, more of a maintenance repair kind of thing uh, and uh, it became quite a big thing the Hink hinkley uh, yacht charter started working out of there and that was a big uh a big uh move for the hinkley company plus all the storage places for the people who wanted to store boats there so it, it turned into a, a the hinkley um I don't know, skunk works is quite the word, but um, uh, Hinkley branch that did basically service work only and uh, no, no construction there other than caveat of one jet boat, but that was, that's a different story. Um, and uh, I was ha head carpenter there for ooh, over 20 years. I don't remember just what, but there's all kinds of uh, adventure stories that happen at a service yard and uh, I was thinking, since this is a maintenance uh, theme, uh, I would w try to keep myself restricted to maintenance. And my thoughts are, uh, as far as carpentry goes, the most important thing with uh, your Hinkley is, is to keep the varnish good. I'm sort of promoting the, my own non-department, but uh, varnish is very important for uh, keeping all the woodwork good. And uh, with that, I'll throw it back over to John. Wow, I don't really had to tell when to uh, where it all began. I think it's nineteen fall of nineteen seventy two when I started down the Hinkley Company. Um, started out in the machine shop, uh, plumbing, using the machinery there. Transferred over in a couple of years into electrical and uh, did that. Wired a lot of B forties, fifties, Pilot thirty fives. Um, at some point joined Hank at Ocean Cruising Yachts and we, uh, we did a good run for about five years. And then uh, after that, went back to the Hinkley Company and uh, worked in the service department. Uh, I liked that much better than production. It was made you think more and it was, uh, you actually learned a lot more work, working a lot more technical things, working in service than you ever did production. Production to me was just, if your job was put the hubcaps on the car, that's all you did. Um, you didn't really learn a lot. You just did the same thing all the time. But um, yeah, it's been a very nice career. And uh, as far as projects, boy, there's been 
a lot of major rebuilds that I've done and been involved with. And uh, it's really hard to tell which one was the most favorite best. There's a couple of 59s did completely complete retrofits on it. Uh, a number of B40s I'm doing retrofit now on a B40 and uh Hinkley competition 41. So it's, uh, it's all fun. All right. Well, with that, um, why don't we go to the questions? Because this, you know, as I sent this one out, I know a lot of people have questions, and we have quite a few people in the audience. So, if you guys want to raise your hand, I can see them here, and then we can uh, we can um, go to questions. Because I have some that people emailed in as well. Um, in fact, we can start with that. Why people get their questions? Uh, one of the questions I got from Bob Schaefer is, um, "What's the best uh, uh, plumbing?" technology to use in boats PEX these days is that what people are using is PEX or is there yes. any other yeah now, uh, yeah PEX PEX type tubing right exactly especially the bigger boats PEX tubing is uh, same as a house it's half inch ID 5 8 OD they do make tubing like we used to use in the boats the old fast and tight tubing which is an OD measurement but standard household PEX tubing is what we're doing now and he's got another question. His his he's got forty two uh, uh, Southwester forty two um, hull number seventy, built in nineteen eighty. Uh, sorry, uh, hull number seven, built in nineteen eighty two, and uh, his every season his rudder fills with water, and there's no obvious leaks. And he's got um, he's he's had to install a drain plug, and it, he drains it at the haul out. Any. And he, I mean, he's probably coming in from the top of the rudder post if I had it. Yeah, that's not uncommon. I, if anytime you have a, a metal rudder post on a fiberglass blade underwater, you're going to get water in. I mean, if you remember, the B40s have a drain hole in them, and yeah. so do the pilots. So we just make sure they drain. So I get that question quite often. I just tell them it's the same. You have the same amount of water pressure inside as you do out. So usually there's not an osmosis blisters problem, just Make sure they drain and don't freeze up. And otherwise, yeah, that freeze up's the key. Yeah, freezing is the thing that usually trips them up. If they get blocked or the whatever in the in the uh, winter time, the water builds up and then they start freezing. Then the arms will break free or it'll split. The, the leak just speeds up, but it's all but impossible to stop as long as it's a hollow rudder and you don't want the weight. So. <laughs> All right, and the last question that Bob has is he's got a Grunert fridge uh, system now and it doesn't work that well. And he Should he switch to a Seafrost? Everything we've done out removing the Grunert system has been replaced with the evaporator system. Typically Seafrost, there's others out there, but you'll find with today's technology and their evaporator plates that um, they do run longer but their actual amount of amp hours being used during the day is a lot less. The evaporator system is the way to go. On an older boat, I've done a couple B40s. Um, we've actually taken the liner out and added more insulation to make it a little bit more efficient. But typically, they're a drop-in plug-and-play unit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I've got a, um, a question for you, Alan. I And this is actually for one of the... Um, owners that I work for, I manage a few boats, Hinkley's for him. And we've got a boat that Kim Hopkins, uh, who everyone probably knows is one of the best um, uh, varnishers still in, in the game, you know, from the Hinkley stock. And she took, uh, took the boat down to, uh, to Bearwood this winter down in Florida and built it up with 15 coats. So now we've got a perfect varnish uh, base and it looks great, but the boat, uh, we can't get any inside storage down here affordably this summer and the boat's going to be in the sunshine all uh right now it looks like because you have to haul the boat uh it's a seasonal boat and it'll be hauled on the hard here in the summer in florida so what do we do to protect that varnish best is there anything we can do treat it put over it cover it i mean it, other than putting it inside uh or just weathering the storm and uh and uh hank that might even be a good question for you i know it kind of relates to alan's point but since you're kind of down south, you deal with a lot of sun in the Carolinas. How do you protect a, a you know a great a, a great varnish job you know uh, through the sunshine, um, or you just sort of grin and bear it and put a coat on as soon as the fall comes? Yeah, I, uh, down here we've had the best results with either covers, which are a bit of a pain. So you got depending on the thing, you got ten or twenty of the damn things to put on, or a tent. I did a Great Harbor Twenty Six 
that stayed in the Chesapeake, which is hot, you know, not as long a season, but in the Chesapeake. And it went five years uh, between coats. Now the cover was for a 26 foot boat was about 3000 bucks. I think it was three pieces. It was fairly lightweight work. It was weighted or and padded around the lower edge, but, but once they got used to putting it on and they were very good about doing it, their varnish lasted better than any I've seen, not to mention protection from the birds and all the rest of that. But uh, that is the best solution. Uh, the tent. You know, both the tent is... the body could be, but one of you other the guys tent. does something on that? Well, we just sent uh, 50, 5901, hull number one. We did a lot of work on this summer and it was going to spend in the winter in Tortola. And what we did on that boat is we did, hang, like Hank said, we put his covers on it. There was tow rail covers, dory covers, tap rail, anything that had teak, even the eyebrow, there was covers made for it. And I talked with the owner last week and uh, the captain on the boat, and they said the vanish is holding up good. Really? And where did you get those covers made? They were made by a local company right here in Hancock County. So maybe I'll get that name from you. Yeah. Um, because that would be, because it, it's just going to be, I know it's going to get hammered down here. And it's just a shame because she's done so. you know, it was a month worth of work and it's just, yeah, won't be the same. Right. I mean, the covers are not cheap, but they're a heck of a lot cheaper than wooding and starting again. Yeah. All right. Anyone else got, uh, Alan, getting points? Yep. Uh, I was going to add, see, we're talking about those tripping take right back to the raw wood and starting again. I think it's very important too, that when you, tape it off for your varnish that you leave a little space between the uh, the fiberglass and the teak so that you're sealing that that little seam that's there as much as possible. It's very important to try to keep water from by capillary action getting sucked into that little crack. So um, it may look the teak good, but it's also serving as a seal. You have to be very important about that that interface there. That's a okay. good point. We started, uh, my daughter has been doing varnish for me the last few years, started uh, when she's done or just before the last coat, putting a, a tape around, leaving a, around the bottom of the tow rail, leaving about a sixteenth of an inch on the deck and on the hull, and then finger filleting with 5200 mahogany, which is pretty dark. So it hides and it does pretty well what Alan just suggested. Uh, you know, sealing that lower edge off so it can't get going. I can't give you a good number in terms of how much it improves it, but certainly I've seen an improvement on that. Yep. Um, Buzz Billick, who was former uh, president of the Hinkley Pilot Association, did the same thing many years ago. And I, I talked with him since then, and he said that was holding up fine. So I personally think it's kind of ugly, but if it's getting yeah. a little bit picky there, but uh, it seems small. to work. You got to keep it small for sure. Yeah. Or it is. I agree with you. All right. We got a question from Brandon. What do you got, Brandon? Yeah. So, well, so just in case anyone else is, it took me a while to find the raise hand button. There's a, at the bottom of the screen, there's reactions. And if you click that, you'll have a raise hand. So just sharing nice. that and, also, um, so uh, you were talking about varnish. Uh, I just want to hear what sort of products you guys want uh, or, or find works best exterior, interior these days. I assume you're using some two-part thing for the for the tow rails, but um, I'll let you talk. Uh, John, you want to see what Hinkley's doing now? Yeah, uh, uh, Epithane's gloss varnish on the exterior. And then uh, on the interior is uh, Epithane's um, satin varnish. Basically, that's all we're using. It works really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we've tried that's worked out well on a couple small boats, and I'm doing a standard 41 right now that, uh, as Alan says, the water gets under the tow rails and around the teak cheek blocks and stuff, and it migrates, water gets in there, turns the varnish black, and you can spend a lot of money stripping varnishing and then a couple of years it's all black again um did a 42 a couple of years ago where we stripped it and we ended up putting on 17 coats of dexolay and that worked out really well it's very thin it takes a lot more of the dexolay to fill in the grain than it does varnish basically you put like eight coats of dexolay on it 
send it back hard, get rid of the high spots, and then continue on with that. And it's holding up actually pretty good. I mean, it's it's bright like varnish, not as bright as varnish, but the salt water doesn't seem to affect it as much. It doesn't lift and turn black. Um, we're going to try it this winter on this 41 right now for this customer um, because the tow rails do leak a lot. They leak a lot where the uh, combings come up against the deck, that seam right there where they migrate water. So we're hoping it'll work on this boat. Another thing, I the boat I just finished down here in Florida with Kim Hopkins, I think she was using most of the build coats she was using, if it makes sense, is 3131. I think that's a all grip product. Is that right? And she was building with that. Did you, did you have you been coming across that, John? They do, they use a two piece all grip on the cabin sole. Um, but otherwise, no, I don't think not all grip on the exterior. No, no, she was using it. It's it's a, all it's made by all grip. I think it's called thirty one thirty one, and she was building with that, and then then doing the final coats with Epiphanus. I think is kind of what she was doing because it it, it goes down so easy, and it sands pretty well. It it's it, it's pretty thin. Uh, it doesn't give you that thick that thick uh, layer you get with the Epiphanus. But it's there, that's what she's doing right now with the build coats. But I'll ask her again. But I think she's using thirty one thirty one for the first one. Maybe call it like maybe seven eight coats. Yeah, well, for exterior varnish, um, Epiphanes does make it's I forget what it's called, but they do make a product like that. If you put four or five coats of that on, just let it soak in, then the yeah. varnish on top of it. And the advantage is it builds up pretty fast, and it it will adhere to the uh, teak really, really well. Acts like a primer per se. It's, it sounds like the description would indicate she might've been using a, a not all wood, but the all bright, what they called a three part system way back. Uh, I did that on Bob's, Barry, what do you have a 40? Flybridge 40 or something? Oh, 44, yeah. It was a 44, okay. I did that when you decided to sell the boat. I think that had an epoxy base and then uh, had an epiphanes and then uh, he had us put on one or two coats and then we waited a bit. We put Albright on it. He told me that after a couple of years of North and South or a year and a half before the boat sold, it held up very well. But it's a, you know, the Albright is a hard finish. It's a bear to get off if you want to take it off. Um, yeah, got, this is just a one part varnish. Uh, it's just one part. It's made by all grip. It's called 3131. And I, and I was surprised that she was oh. mixing all grip and she's the queen. She, her, you know, yep, her, yep. her email is varnish queen at yahoo.com. If you ever want to email her, but she, she is probably as good as it gets. And she does use those two products and she mixes them. So she'll go with the all grip 3131 for the first, maybe even seven, 10 coats and then switch over to the uh, Epiphanus. Anyway, that hmm. seems to work well for her. Um, all right. So we have, uh, Bobby Kennedy in the audience once. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have you me there? Yes, sir. What do you got? Uh, well, I'm, I'm calling about, uh, chrome plated bronze pieces, but, but to what y'all are speaking of with the varnish, um, I bought this B40 in 1984. Uh, and the previous owner had put the um, what was it? I, I have a, I've had some strokes and I have a hard time remembering names. But you all just spoke of the clear all grip, and he had put that on all of his bright work. I didn't know it at the time, and I don't think he knew what would happen. But eventually, that moisture gets under there somehow, rubber, and it turns black. And I took the boat to a yard up, and I'm in South Carolina. I took the boat to a yard up in North Carolina who told me during the winter they don't have much work and they can take care of it. They didn't realize it was all grip. And um, so the guy gave me a price on everything, and I had, didn't, I had on the boat for a very short period of time, so I was very naive about everything. And, um, and then he called me, and he said, you know, there's something wrong here. I can't do this work, and da 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 and um, so I called the previous owner and he said, oh yeah, I put all grip on it and all. Well, I might say that to get the all grip off so that the varnish work could be done properly was very, very expensive. And um, 
I'm down south here. Of course, the boat's out of doors 365 days a year. And it's not like it, it goes into your, your old yard up in Maine or wherever for nine months out of the year. So it, that's, it is brutal. And I had covers made for the tow rails. And that was a big help when I used them. And I did use them in the beginning, but I began to not use them. And, of course, then I had to go back to the varnish again. One thing that did help is right after I bought that boat, I ordered from Hinkley a, um, um, what did they call it? It stretched from the mizzen mast to the main mast. It's an awning. And yeah. Hinkley made it then. And it had three aluminum poles that went through it, and it covered all the way out to the rub rails on both sides of the boat. Plus, it had a zipper that would zip up each side. It, you could move it from whatever side you needed on. It would give you more shade. And I will have to tell you, of course, you, that wasn't up all the time, but that made a tremendous difference in how long my varnish uh, worked. Um, remained in good shape i still have those now um haven't used them much lately but the reason i i wanted to get on your show is i'm trying to find chrome plated brass fittings for interior um drawers and the chart locker that's over the top i guess a lot of b40s have that over the refrigeration freezer um has broken and I'm trying to find w one similar to that. And then there's some smaller drawers uh, down below, um, just uh, forward. No, I'm tired of listening to that guy. I'm All right, sorry. So, so you're looking for some parts, uh, Bobby? Yes. Where yes, would you get I some am. parts? Yes, I, I, I am. And I didn't know whether Hinkley still had anything or whatever. I have one part here in my hand and it has on the inside I took it off I unscrewed it, took it off and it has capital P period capital L period capital C small O period which says it's PL company to me I don't know who that is but it's it's a, a, a company that apparently made these four um Hankley B40s are you still with me there yeah, Bob, is those is that the rectangular um, chrome plated pull out? Yes, inch and yeah. a half by three, something like that. Yeah, uh, I think I would say it was two, two by two and a half, maybe, but maybe you're probably right. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, those are no longer available. What we've been doing on the older boats is we've been purchasing, depend on the interior, usually mahogany is. You can buy almost the same thing, the same size that's mahogany and we just been routing them in vanishing them in and just putting them in the same in the same location um because that particular product you have i mean you could send them out and have them re-chromed if they're not corroded that bad well they're not corroded because they've been inside but some of them have broken just from where it's, the boat was a 1968 boat yeah and um so yeah, there's a lot of age on it and uh, a lot of age on me i might have i'm 82 now but uh um uh, I've, I've had the boat for 30, oh, the boat's had me, she's had me for 38 years, and I've really enjoyed her, but I'm old and not good in help, so I'm going to have to part ways with her, but, um, and I'm trying to get everything looking really good, um, so, right, right. Uh, and I really enjoy listening to this program, by the way. Yeah, well, I'll, yeah. you know, here's, I'll send you a, uh, um, an email, uh, if you put your email in the chat uh, to me that respond to that text, uh, Bobby, I mean, I'll help you pin down some of these things. But any other advice, uh, Alan? I well, know you've redone a bunch of B40s, Alan, uh, and, and, and especially the older ones. You got any tips for Bobby on where to find these parts? Um, yeah, uh, I do have a tip. Uh, I, uh, I'm kind of old school when it comes to these older um, Hinkleys. I call it the Duesenberg effect, where I I think it's important to try to keep them as original as possible. And uh, to that end, we've uh, found a source called Whitechapel. It's a C-H-A-P-P-L-E, Whitechapel. 
Uh, it's a amazing source for all kinds of uh, strange hardware, and frequently you can find something that comes pretty close to what what the original Hinkley parts were. So uh, that's White Chapel again. Okay, and, and uh, do you have a mailing address? No, we can find it. Yeah, she, my, no, my wife says she can find it. She knows what she's doing on these computers, and I don't. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for that question. Um, we got Nick Neighbor has a question. Yeah, I actually have two. Uh, thank you. Um, one, uh, the I have a 36 Picnic Boat Classic, and the teak on the swim platform is obviously not varnished. Is there a recommended standard product and shade to use on that teak? I've been using Semco, but they have, you know, I don't know if that's the, the traditional uh, application or product. And then if there's a specific color that was used from the factory. I don't remember anything being put on them, John, do you? No, most of the ones that leave the factory are, uh, are uh, beer tea. Um, I know every time we launch a new one here in the spring, I mean, a boat in the spring, uh, they're cleaned at the dock and there's just traditional uh, teeth cleaner in, in the left bear. Okay, okay. They just turn very gray very quick. And uh, yeah, so the dealer seems to do a very nice job for, you know, maybe two months of the two months and then you put a little more on and you get about two more months and put a little more on and the season's over. Um, okay, that's helpful. And then thank you. My second question, um, I'm curious if anyone knows how to get their hands on I'd love to see like a laminate spec um, of the hull and the deck, you know, where there's coring, where there's not, if there's coring, you know, it, does such a thing like that exist? I'm sure we have, uh, what's the hull number of your pitney boat? One, two, three. 123? That. So the what, like 2004? We five. may have that in self. I, I don't, we have some of the original <laughs> boats. If it's scrimped, I may or may not have that information it's a, it was a 99 to answer your question hank oh. um yeah i just would love to get it because you know it's, it's just good to know what's behind uh uh you know what you're what you may or may not be adding to and so um that's where the curiosity comes from sure i do have the laminate schedule of the earlier ones i i may have that you could um contact me J Pratt at hinkleyarts.com and I'll see if I can get that laminate schedule for you. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that. I'll do it. Sure. All right, Bob Beebe, what do you got? Uh, back to varnish. Somehow we got off that. Mm -hmm. I was talking with um, Peter Mackay about his B40 Katahdin. Uh, he does his own work for the most part, cosmetically anyway. And um, he tells me that he has moved away from Epiphanus, which we all love, because he can get three coats of all grip in one day. I don't know which one of their um, products, but but he can build up fast, three times a day. And that, that's the real factor. So I throw that out. Yeah, that's a, what is that, easy coat or? No, I can't try to think of that. I haven't used it, but I, I know people who do with good results. I've always been concerned about easy on, easy off. I mean, has it gassed off as much as it should? But the reports I get are quite positive about that. Alan, John, thoughts? Uh, it's, we haven't used it for the exterior. We mostly use the epithanes, like I said before. We've had, use, use it it with pretty good luck with that. I think it is epithanes, isn't it, that he's using, Rob? I thought uh, Rob's Peter, Peter, if if you were asking me, Peter says he's moving. He still uses some epiphanes here and there, but he's it, just because of the time involved. He can he can move faster on the calendar with with this um, all grip that he's using. But I can't tell you what it's one of their varnish products. I think it's called all wood. It's a it sprinkle like all wood yeah. for the day. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I'll add one one little thing that um, the epiphanes is uh, I've discovered, and I think John will agree too, that it remains soft for quite a long time, doesn't really harden up. And if you have, um, uh, say, on deck the, the lazarette cover or the propane cover where both the top and the frame with this on the boat are both uh, varnished, yeah, we've had this situation where if you put those back together, 
and uh, after a few days that soft varnish would actually stick itself together so that the covers were very difficult to remove well in, when you're making varnish you, they all use different solvents that's one thing and you don't want to there are several of the um the, the hydro uh i forget what they are chemically but they can react so um you have to stick with one brand because the solvents uh, uh, can interact with each other and cause problems. Well, that was that point I was Even, making with 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 Kim using the because you know the thirty one thirty one product from all all grip is not you know uh, an all grip because I know they varnish some of those old boats. They would try to all grip them without like epoxy, and it never worked because it traps so much moisture. I think, and they turn black. But uh, this thirty one thirty one is a varnish product, and I was surprised that she was mixing products from two different companies to su such success because of exactly what you're saying. But apparently, she's done doing it religiously, and it works pretty well. Something to investigate. Do you know anyway. about the Barry? Do you know about the time between switching products? I mean, is it is no it, time? You know, no, she hits going it, right, no. one right after the other. So I mean, she's she's you know it might be a day. But yeah. she's, you know, she's putting down three coats of that 3131 on a hot, on a good warm day. She can get down three coats of that little light sanding, you know, on a small, not obviously not a massive area because she doesn't cover a lot of, you know, a ton of ground at, at one person can't, but, you know, she can get, um, you know, three coats on a tow rail on a 40 foot boat in a, in a day, on a good day, a long day. But um, then, you know, you want to you know, rough it up and then give it a day and then you start putting the epiphanus down on the final coats. She, I mean, I didn't, I was watching her do it for a month and she didn't seem really mm -hmm have to have to have to weigh much hmm. i will say one thing about epiphanes and, and others may have different experience it can be a tough material to put down in the sunlight and even here in north carolina uh you've got to you've got to be thinning it constantly to to keep the consistency and the flow up where in a service yard you know if you're inside you got all kinds of flexibility but it can be it can be a tough one to uh, apply. We've even gone back to you know the old fashioned varnishes occasionally when in the middle of the summer when we really couldn't get going early enough in the day to finish up before the heat built up. So anyway, but more coats on the old fashioned one. The epiphanes will build up nicely if you can get it in place. Um, people can also ask questions in, in the uh, chat if you have any uh, questions. Um, there's no other hands right up now. Right I have a question. Um, I'm always searching for, and this, you know, maybe John, uh, Hank, I, I don't know if any of you, you know, how to eliminate the head smell on older boats that, you know, you know, the holding tank's clean. It's got an old holding tank. Um, yeah, I've seen some of these new electronic products on the market that, that say they can get rid of uh, with ionization or something. Can get rid of the head smell. Any, any hacks there? Anyone? What are you guys doing? Uh, to be honest with you, the best thing we find is when you rehose the system, which we do quite a few in the wintertime, um, is to use a really good top quality hose. And the stuff we're talking about is $21, $22 a foot. You know, it's not $3 a foot rubber hose. There is hoses out there that will not permeate odor and try to try not to have any long horizontal runs. If you've got a long horizontal run, replace it with schedule 40 PVC and have short length of hose. But the biggest thing is most people will buy an inexpensive hose like you might use on a deck drain or something like that. And then a couple of years it permeates right through. So you've got to, you've got to have a really good hose designed for that application and keep those horizontal runs to a minimum. Is Hinkley coming out with their boats with that $21 foot hose yes. standard these days? Yeah. yeah. In any boat I do right now that comes in for work, that's where I tell them, you got to buy this hose. And if they want to purchase hose from West Marine, that's four or $5 a foot that we say, no, thank you. I what, remember, what is that? What is that hose uh, brand? Shields. Don't. Shields. Yeah. Shields. Marine. So that's generally the culprit is the hose is, 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 is yes. permeating. Yeah. Right. Okay. Most of those, any, any rubber hose is going to permeate odor. Got no matter it. whose brand it is. So how long will these shields ones the last? I'm how sorry. Long these, how long will these ones from shields last before they permeate? I've gotten 10 years out of them. Yeah, at least that. 
Okay. okay. Alan, you got something on practical, that? Practical. Yes. A practical sailor did a, did a serious test of all these uh, hoses quite a few years ago now. And they confirmed just what John, John just said, that the best hose is the best thing. But uh, as you say, too, it's none of it is totally impermeable and eventually it'll break down. But one other thing I'll add to that, too, is making sure that you have a good vacuum breaker, too. I've seen a lot of these little old brass ones that people uh, hook hoses to and run <clears> down to <throat> the bills because they're they're leaking so badly. If they're leaking, they're not working right. And uh, I recommend a, a brand called Scott Vacuum Breakers um, as the, the best ones that are most durable. Uh, I'll let John talk about that too. Yeah, no, they were great. I agree. Some of the cheaper brass ones um, plug up real fast or they corrode and they don't last very long and you get odor coming out of them. The other important thing is with a holding tank is to make sure you install a filter on the holding tank. That makes a huge difference, especially if it's vented outside on deck or up in the up in the bow pulpit or stern pulpit. That really makes a big difference. But even on some of the older, say, Hinkley 50s, and I've done it on a couple of B40s with a settee, that we've replaced a lot of those runs with Schedule 40 PVC. I mean, you can heat it up and bend it, but if you've got an eight-foot straight run, behind a settee or something, make sure that's Schedule 40 PVC and not hose. That makes a huge difference. And that's basically will last forever. Okay, good to know. Really good to know. Cause I got, a, I'm bird dogging one, right? I'm, we got, on the, I'm not gonna tell you the boat. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it, but we got over and over again. You've done everything. So that that's probably the culprit. I think it's a long run. I think that's what it is probably. It's gonna have, it has a very long run. All right, uh, Mark Hunter uh, has a question. Oh yeah, uh, g'day everyone. Um, I'm in Sydney, Australia, uh, and I own um, Evening Star. It's a um, it's a H49. Used to be owned by Rockefeller, um, and I've had it for ten years, and I'm in the process of, of keeping it afloat. This is very tricky sometimes, um, uh, and I'll just time in with the um, with the uh, discussion on um, on head odors. Uh, it was very poor when when I received my vote, and uh, I followed. Uh, to the word, a book by um, uh, Peggy Lee called "Getting Rid of Boat Odors," and um, and we now have zero smell uh, out of any head at all. Um, and the holding tanks are used 100% of the time. Uh, we don't have any straight flush through it, um, and it's um, and the boat is now free of all of all those head odors. Um, you know, the simple thing was using fresh water, changing the fresh water flush. Um, H49 is a thousand liters of water, so that's very easy to do, and um, and we also use uh, um, uh, solid bacteria in there and no, nothing blue, no blue chemicals, nothing you buy at West Marine um, because all that stuff, it just kills all the good bacteria. Um, and then I'm, I'm completely um, uh, completely odor free now, which is great. Um, I do have a couple of questions um, and, uh, and also note that um, I see that uh, uh, Mr. Pratt, you're online. We've had a few discussions over the years um, on email and thank you very much for your service, John. Um, uh, it's great to be able to still talk to someone at Hinkley who knows about the boats and uh, you've been uh, a great help um, um, uh, regularly. My main question at the moment is um, just in regards to the, um, uh, the tow rails again, but I have, um, I have the Genoa track attached on top of the tow rail. Uh, it's obviously been there 40 years and quite a few of the through bolts, uh, the heads are coming off and all crevice corrosion is in there. Uh, I've asked numerous shipwrights to if they can um if they can rebolt it back down again um i've actually stopped using it i'll put i put some more geno blocks on the deck itself because it was it was starting to lift off every shipwright has um has, has run away from the job thinking it's just too hard to do has anyone actually attacked that before um remove those tow rails on the uh, sorry remove the genoa track off the tow rail and managed to refasten it anyway we have done it obviously it's very expensive what what I would notice if there's a lot of water in the tow rail, as you walk forward or as you walk in the tow rail, you'll start seeing vertical black lines in the teak tow rail, which indicates that those fasteners have got water in them. And a lot of times you put a bit brace on them and Alan can tell you, you give a half a turn, they break off. So we have taken tow rails off. If they were half decent, put them back on. But typically at that point, uh, you break so much stuff off, you end up replacing the tow rail. But uh, um, 
it can be very difficult because most of the Hinkleys, especially the early ones, B-40s, Pilots, 41s, 49s, all those boats, the uh, nuts for the rail are glassed over. So the tow rail is drilled and tapped into the deck and deck flange, but the, the actual general track is drilled and tapped, but it's nutted and flat washer, lock washer, and then glassed over. So they're bare to get underneath the deck and with a Dremel tool or something and break that glass out so you can get the nut off them. Right, yeah, that's that. That's why my, my shipwrights have all run away. They didn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of labor. I think the last time I did that, we had about 120 man hours in replacing the fasteners. Uh, and that's, we had to repair part of the rail. We did not replace it. But it, it took the guy, and with, with help, occasionally pretty near three weeks to do it yeah that wouldn't surprise me yeah i see you did pretty good yeah i think we did yeah we drove them up through and slotted the heads and played with them a lot but we got it i i um, pulled one off a long time ago that was uh quite wet and um when we went to put it back on it, it was so wet that it actually had lengthened itself by about an inch and a half so that as you got to the back end the screw holes no longer lined up it was a uh, not a pleasant experience run into him run into that but that would that would kill the day for sure anything else mark uh no that's all no that's great thank you okay brendan did you have another question your hand was up you good <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, all right, so for, for tow rails, um, there were, uh, my, my boat sat under a fair cloud cover all summer uh, before I picked it up and I, I noticed the little little tiny spots of rot in the in the teak um, after I got it home. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, wondering, do, uh, any, do you guys, can you recommend any products that, that, that'll do a better color match than the off the shelf wood rot epoxy putty stuff that that they use or or am i just being lazy and i should cut out the teak and put a new piece of teak in there you know just thoughts on thoughts on something like that i would imagine most any filler you try and put in there mark is probably going to show up i don't know if anything that would really adhere really good to the teak um like a a filler type a bondo type filler um we will cut Dutchman's into a teak toil that's got damage in small parts and laminate in a new piece that seems to work better. Um, but I don't really know of any compound or putty that you could put in there that would actually last. Okay. Yeah, that's the problem. I, I agree with John. It, it's really hard to get something to stay in there. Is there is yeah. one in that rail. Yeah, I, I did I did it 10 years ago and it start, it's, it's failing pretty bad at this point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thoughts, Alan? You got any thoughts um, on this? Well, yeah, I I, I, I dislike <laughs> trying to this patching job, but um, yep. when pressed to do it, uh, I've used teak dust, but when you make teak dust and epoxy, it comes out very dark. So I cut the teak dust with uh, uh, an epoxy filler called 410 filler, which is basically ground up styrofoam that's light tan color. So mm -hmm. the light tan color and the teak dust mixed together uh, comes out <clears throat> matching the teak sort of in color. But then uh, um, after it was hardened, I'd take a little magic marker and draw a few little mm -hmm. lines in it too. <laughs> and it, it's definitely a, a funky patch job, but um, it's about as close as I could come. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, I had a question uh, real quick and maybe... Uh... John or Hank or Alan would know the answer. One of the boats I manage is uh, uh, white all grip, and it's got exhaust staining on the transom, and the all grips obviously absorb the tra the exhaust, and it's not super old. All grip is probably six seven years old, and I can't seem to get it out with any cleaner. It it I think it just it's it's stained with exhaust and it's it is the exhaust and it's it's white. It's it's too bad because the boat is beautiful. And then you look at the transom and it's stained 
from the exhaust and i can't uh, am i are we is it part of the transom now is it this is what it is or is there something that i'm missing that we can't seem to find to, to get rid of that exhaust stain i would say it depends on how well it depends on how thick your all grip is put on i mean we we have taken some of them out of uh, like a red howl um, or, or a silver gray howl by using a buffin rouge, you know, starting off with like a, a thousand grit and then working your way up to about 2000 grit with a, with a buffer. Um, if it's on the surface, it will take it out. But if, if it's permeated into the surface of the all grip, you'll probably burn through the top coat and get into the primer long before you got the discoloration out. Hmm. It so. certainly sounds because he's he's worked on it so much like the surface might have already been burnished or something yeah. and the surface on which is is you know a nice seal is gone so the inside of it is is accepting that color and staining I wonder if it wouldn't be easier to just paint the transom yeah it's, I mean that's kind of what we're at but yeah um it, you know then the letter then the letters come off and the gold leaf and everything it's just right you know, Lot bigger yeah. job. Is, it, is that exhaust through this right through the back of the stern or is that down under the counter down under the counter and it just lingers you know when you're offshore it just hangs it gets sucked into the vacuum when the boat's moving you know and just hangs and and the uh, only thing that might help you if you extend that exhaust down about an inch and a half away from the hull mm. that will help a lot it really? may not eliminate it but it will it'll decrease it tremendously because we were looking at replumbing the whole exhaust system, which is big money. Uh, but if you think we can get some benefit from just adding an inch and a half to the to the exterior exhaust flange? Is, is that exhaust flush now, or does it stick to it's the hull? Pardon? It's, it's pretty flush. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah. yeah no, if, if you stick it down inch. about an inch and a half, then that will eliminate a huge portion of it. Really? Okay. John, do you do you tap into the fitting that's there and just add a small nipple to it? Depends on whether it's metal or fiberglass. You can take another yeah. metal fitting, uh, say, I don't know what size it is, but let's say it's three inch exhaust and you've got two and a half inch Schedule 80 pipe. You can turn that down so it's really thin, so it, so it slides up inside of it. And with a couple of fasteners, you can hold it in place. So basically, you're just trying to get that away from the hull a little bit. Yep. So it doesn't stick. Yeah, it just launches it. I got it. All right, we got time for uh, one or two more. Bob Beebe, what do you got? Robert Beebe? You might be on mute. Well, while you're trying to do that, I'll do one quick thing then. I take no credit for it all, but I've heard one guy say that if you, there's a a commercial coffee stain remover that works very well for getting rid of exhaust stains, but I haven't tried it. I had, don't know. Just throwing that out there. Hmm. When you know the name of it or just Google commercial coffee stain remover. Yeah. Worth a try before we paint the whole boat. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I guess that um, Bob BB has a question, but he's on mute. So, um, that's not happening. We are at seven o'clock. I've taken a lot of you guys time. I appreciate you guys all. I'll show one up. Um, as to things, um, John, you'll remember Alex and I brushed the the white hull of Acorn yes. before she came to you. And we will swear by the fact even today that the brushed all grip has greater resistance to staining than the sprayed. And that has to do with the solvents that are used for each of the respective hardeners and uh, thinnings and so forth. But um, we had tremendous luck with with brown, brush, brushing the um, it, it It retains the glass uh, effect, the glossiness is retained for two or three years longer. It's just, it it's it's different. And it's not easy to do in a boatyard, but for two guys with a Bermuda 40, we had great success. Yeah, I think because the brush the brushing thinner is a different compound than the spraying thinner and some of the other products, uh brushing versus thinner. I I I would agree. It's probably uh probably better, but 
brushing a B40 deck, you'd have to have a lot of patience. <laughs> That's a lot of area. Oh, yeah, yeah, but I, I could say, John, I so let's say we repaint this boat, we could spray the whole boat and just tip the transom, right? Right. Well, the other thing, too, I want to look there is... Well, is that possible? Would that be crazy to just say, okay, we want to spray the whole boat, but because we know the, pr- the transom is going to get the exhaust exposure that we just actually hand or you know, tip it, tip the transom in sure. our group. But I, I'd want to look at the other th- the other question there or the other item there is why is that engine smoking? I, mean, I understand there's a problem, but you don't want well, to put a new engine in. Symptoms, you don't want to it. play with the symptoms instead of fixing the problem. So I think I'd want to look at why is that engine smoking so bad and then maybe yeah. do something there too. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Any other questions before we get to dinner time? <laughs> no? Well, I really appreciate everyone coming. This is a lot of fun for everyone, for us. Thanks for uh, uh, John and, and Hank and, and Alan for your time. And um, I, we'll, we'll do, we got some more planned. I'll send out some, uh, on some notes. We've got a lot of ideas coming in. Um, I know the, some guys in the Great Lakes um, just rebuilt a 1949 uh Southwester, uh, all wood. And they've, they've been sending me the photos. Pretty amazing. Um, what they've been doing with that boat is called Loon out in, uh, out in, uh, Wisconsin, I believe. So that might be a nice topic for something we can do later on, but Hi, thanks, for ta- thanks for your time, everyone. And, um, we'll, uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. All right. Hey, well, thank you. All right. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.